Good morning. Thank you to Sheila and Sarah Whip for preparing our hearts for worship with that wonderful Christmas song. It's fourth Sunday in Advent already. Are you ready for Christmas? Because you only have a couple days left. <laughs> How many shopping days? I'm looking at the guys in particular. <laughs> it's good to be in the house of the Lord with you, surrounded by these beautiful Christmas decorations. God is good. And all the time. Amen. I invite you to stand and join with me in our call to worship. The Lord is glorious and exalted. The Lord is shining in our hearts and lives. God's people are often in distress and sorrow. The Lord show your might and deliver us from evil. We sometimes do not feel the Lord's presence. The Lord was the shepherd of his people, Israel. Lord, lead us in our way and guide us in our world. In this Advent season, we stand in expectation. Emmanuel, invade our lives. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and turn your attention to our worship screen as we sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. sing that song and others like it. Let's pray together. God, our Heavenly Father, we gather this morning in Christmas expectation, that moment when you gave us your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins. And in that event, you also sent your Holy Spirit to fill Mary with the presence of Christ. So Father, as Mary was filled with the grace of God, may we too be filled with the overflowing of your grace. We sing about making room in our hearts for you. So let that be our prayer this morning. Come into our hearts, Lord Jesus. There is room for you. Empower our worship. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning and God bless if you're joining us through our television ministry today. Let's take a second and welcome each other.
Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Today we relight the candles of expectation and hope, recalling God's promise. Candle of preparation, remembering the voice crying in the wilderness, urging the people to prepare the way of the coming Lord. And the candle of proclamation, reminding us of the joy found in Him. Now we light the candle of revelation and peace. We celebrate the announcement of the coming king and the greatness of God's love revealed through the Christ child. Thank you once again to Sheila and Sarah Whitf. And for those of you who uh, may have saw some familial uh, characteristics, that was my family up here, uh, Dylan and Katie, my daughter-in-law Katie, and my two granddaughters, Everly and Myla. Um, they inherited my impatience. Hi, Evie. She needs, she needs toys just like most of you actually do to get through the whole service. <laughs> it is the uh, fourth Sunday of Advent. All four candles are lit. There's only one more to go, and that's the one we'll light on Christmas Eve. So thank you for uh, Dylan and Katie for doing that for us today. At this time, I would ask is there, uh, if there's any announcements that we need to be made aware of. Well, just a reminder, this coming Thursday uh, is Christmas Eve. We'll be having our Christmas Eve candlelight service at 5 p.m. here. Just to uh, basically do what we like to do at Christmas time. We hear the Christmas story and sing lots of Christmas songs, and uh, we're going to have a, a special music by our own Emily Kirshenman singing one of my favorite Christmas songs, Oh Holy Night, and she does such a wonderful job with that. Looking forward to uh, hearing that once again. And I would encourage you to uh, attend if you can, but it will be televised as well on Channel 90 if you uh, don't feel comfortable for uh, COVID restrictions. How about prayer requests today? I do have a few. Um, those of you who have been keeping tabs on Lorna Pronti, had, she had kind of a bad week this week. Uh, had a, some sort of infection in her body she didn't even really know about, and... Uh, it got to be pretty serious for a while there. and uh, She went in and got some antibiotics. She has to go in every day now to take antibiotics until things clear up, but she had a very high fever, and uh, it was just basically feeling kind of cruddy. Um, and, of course, if you have chemotherapy and, and you know, you're fighting cancer, any kind of infection or any, any other really medical issue that you have on top of that becomes even more complicated. And so I know that she very much appreciates your thoughts and, and uh, your prayers for her. Also, uh, we want to, let's see if I can pronounce his name, Mark Hernanimous. It's Judy Walter's uh, extended family uh, passed away from uh, complications from COVID this week, and so we want to keep that family in our prayers as well, uh, along with the fact that 
You know, uh, in my own in my own life, I you know, most of you are on Facebook and in, in some level, and every once in a while you get em- rem- the memories that pop up, you know, from how many years ago or whatever the case might be. Well, uh, 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 yesterday uh, it was kind of an anniversary, a sad anniversary of my great grandfather. Uh, who passed away just before Christmas. And anytime you lose somebody just before Christmas, it's, it's a hard thing because it really, uh, you know, this is supposed to be a time of joy and expectation and, you know, uh, holiday greetings and all that kind of uh, uh, stuff that we're used to. And then in the midst of it, you have loss and you have grief and you have pain. And so there's this weird mix of things that happen with people uh, at this time of the year. And we want to be mindful of that. You know, uh, we can't force ourselves to be joyful, but at the same time, we can't forget that the reason that we are supposed to be joyful is that uh, we have a savior who has conquered death and uh, we get to share in that inheritance. And so even the people who are grieving right now, even though we might be separated from a time, uh, for a time rather, uh, we know that that's only temporary and we all have, we have a, a common hope. And that's really what we need to take joy in at this time of the year. Other prayer requests today? Um, I guess more of an announcement than anything else. I know many of you um, heard that Pastor Harold Salem passed away uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, 99 years old. And I believe he worked up until the day he passed away uh, preaching the word of God. And uh, the reason I wanted to bring that up is just because he, he's had such a wonderful impact on the world. I, I think I, yeah, I got the, the DVD that they sent out for his ministry uh, oh, several months back. It was called The Heart of the Shepherd. It's kind of uh, documenting his life. And it was just kind of a fascinating story. But uh, apparently they, that, his messages reached 14 million households all over the globe uh, from Aberdeen, South Dakota. And uh, to me, that's interesting because it was Pastor Harold that sort of gave us the impetus, uh, the idea of doing worship at Bethany. You know, if somebody from South Dakota could do it, uh, maybe we could follow in his footsteps and, and do the same thing. And so uh, uh, just a, a great man of the Lord who had a tremendous impact for, uh, on God's kingdom, and kind of gives us an example for us all to follow. So we want to keep his family in our our prayers as well. I know that's a hard thing to lose somebody so special. Should we go to the Lord and seek his grace together? Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is a day that you have made. Help us to rejoice and to be glad in it. And we are glad, Lord, that we can come to this place on the fourth Sunday of Advent and look at all these beautiful Christmas decorations and be reminded of what season that we are in. It's a season of hope and expectation, a season of joy. It's a season that reminds us of the greatest gift that we've ever been given, a gift that was wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. Father, we have a savior. And for that reason, no matter what's happening in our lives, we know that we have a reason for joy. We thank you for that wonderful gift. As we've said so many times in the past, we don't deserve it. There's nothing that we could do to earn it. We simply have to receive it. And so we pray for those who you've been speaking to, perhaps for months or maybe even years, with your still small voice. And for those who have not yet received that gift of the Savior, we pray that this time of the year would be a holy time for them, that they would finally open their hearts to the salvation that you provide so that they too have the eternal hope that we share as the body of Christ. Father, as we have mentioned, we know that this time of the year is filled with mixed emotions, both of, of joy as well of sorrow, because we know that there are people who are very much a part of our lives who are no longer there. And when we get together as a family, that's a reminder of that pain that we feel. But we also know, Lord, that our hope is in you. So we thank you for the grace that you have provided for us. We thank you for the families that we do have. We thank you for all those who have gone before us in the faith and are now enjoying the inheritance that you have prepared for them, the same inheritance that we get to share one day when we take our final breath in this life. And for that reason, Lord, we all have reasons to, to rejoice and to hope and to exclaim the glorious works of our God. We know that you are with us through the good times and the bad. And so we ask for your continued grace to be with those who are, tho- uh, who are suffering right now, who are going through difficult times. We think of Lorna Pronti and the difficult week that she's had. We simply ask, Lord, that your spirit would fill her to overflowing, help her to know that you are near, 
that she is in your hands and there is nothing hidden from you. As always, we pray that you would use the doctors as healing instruments. And Father, we also know that there are those who are, are grieving the loss of a of dear loved one right before Christmas. That's a hard thing. But we pray, Lord, that their focus would be overwhelmed, not by grief, but by the hope that we have in Jesus. Christmas is about joy. And even when we're grieving, we know that it can still be about joy. And for all those, Lord, who come to worship or are tuning in with heavy burdens, give them an extra measure of faith. Help them to turn their eyes heavenward, to keep their eyes and their gaze focused on the author and perfecter of our faith. Whatever troubles, whatever burdens they might be experiencing, help them, Lord, to, to trust in you and to lay those burdens down and to simply allow you to be God, our great shepherd. We thank you for the mission that you have given to this church, the opportunities of ministry that we have. As we turn our attention to a new calendar year, we pray that those opportunities would continue to increase, that we might be faithful representatives of our Lord Jesus Christ and preach the gospel to those who you are calling into the kingdom. Accept these imperfect prayers. May they rise before you as incense through the power of the Holy Spirit. And may you be exalted in all we say and all that we do. It's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 177, Jesus' Name Above All Names.
This morning we'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Also found on page 10 to 14 in your pew Bibles, if you'd like to read along there. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, a firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The Gospel of our Lord. I was listening to a radio program this week which discussed something that was absolutely fascinating to me. What was being discussed was the speed of light. I'm sure that all of you find that subject fascinating as well, the speed of light. But in case you forgot from your middle school days, the speed of light travels at 186,282 miles per second. Not per hour, per second. That's fast. How far could a person get if we were able to travel that fast? Well, I'll give you the answer. Since the moon is roughly 225,000 miles away from Earth, we could get to the moon in just over a second. How many of you would like to do that? Now, if that concept wasn't already hard enough for us to grasp, most of us couldn't even imagine such speeds, unless you're my aunt living in the Twin Cities driving on 494. Don't tell her I said that. Let me expand on this a little bit further. If light travels at 186,000 miles, uh, 282 miles per second, rather, it also means that it travels at 11,176,920 miles per minute. It also means that it travels 670,615,200 miles per hour. Are you bored yet? Now, most of us have never heard measurements of light minutes or light hours. However, I would bet most of us have heard the scientific measurement of light year. If light travels at 186,000 miles in one second, how far can light travel in an entire year? Well, the answer is roughly six trillion miles. To put it another way, you and I cannot comprehend the kind of speed and distance that we're talking about here. To add one more element to this, the next closest star to us is 4.3 light years away. That's roughly 20 trillion miles away. Now the reason I was so intrigued by these astronomical numbers that demonstrate the vastness of our universe is because of a verse that I came across many years ago that has always stuck with me. This is from Isaiah chapter 40. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand, marked off the heavens. The breadth, the span, is usually a measurement from here to here. Who has marked off the breadth of the heavens with his hand? So let me ask you something this morning. How big do you understand God to be? In light of the vastness of the universe and the fact that God can measure light years with the palm of his hand. Do we really think that there's anything in our lives that is too big for God? What a mighty God we serve, and the heavens indeed declare his glory. I was thinking about these things as I pondered again this wonderful account of Jesus' birth from the Gospel of Luke. 
The focus of the entire universe and all its vastness is directed to the scene unfolding in this little town of Bethlehem. Wow. Now, the way Luke brings us into the events surrounding Jesus' birth puts us in really what amounts to, uh, amounts to be a confrontation. A confrontation that exists between the greatest power in the known world set against the divine plan of God. I want to give you a little background that will help us to uh, set this event into its proper context. A few decades before the birth of Jesus, there was a, a Roman leader by the name of Julius Caesar. Some of you have probably learned something about him during uh, world history classes in school. And during his rule, he began to set the stage for what would uh, later become the belief that Roman emperors were at least in some way a little bit divine, a little bit godlike. Jump ahead now to the year 63 BC, when a child is born by the name of Gaius Octavian. He was the grandnephew and later adopted son and designated heir of the great Julius Caesar. Octavian began to rule the Roman Empire in 27 BC, and he became known uh, widely for his, well, rather controversial leadership. It was great leadership, but oftentimes it was controversial. He was also known for initiating what is known in history as the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Accordingly, the people attributed to, uh, to him this godlike status, even referring to him as a son of a god. The title Augustus was also given to him by the Roman, Sen a Roman Senate, which also carries designations of being somewhat divine. He was the most powerful figure in the entire known world. And into this world, ruled by the great Caesar Augustus, Luke introduces the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor in Syria. Why did the census need to be taken? The answer, because Caesar ordered it. He wanted it. And what Caesar wants, Caesar gets. Why? Because he's the most powerful man in the entire Roman world. The Romans controlled most of Europe, a great deal of Asia, large parts of Africa, and nearly all of the Middle East. That's a large, large area. There was no greater power in the world, and in sitting on top of it is Caesar Augustus. And of course, with such a large territory to rule, the way that they would handle that is to appoint lesser leaders to govern certain areas. And so we read about this man, Quirinius, who was the, the governor in the region around Jerusalem. So did God know about the godlike status of Caesar Augustus? Did God know about the so-called peace that Caesar brought to the entire Roman world? Did God know that Caesar controlled the lives of all the people living in the lands that he ruled? And of course, the answer is yes. God knew all about Caesar. And I think the reason that Luke presents the birth of Jesus in this way, that is in the context of this mighty world power, is to remind his readers of something that you and I, I think, sometimes often forget. In the providence of God, all things work towards his purpose. At first glance, it certainly looks like Caesar is the one calling the shots here, doesn't it? He has ordered a census to be taken, most likely for the purposes of taxation. Caesar wanted to make sure that his subjects were paying for his protection and for his leadership and for his peace. And if a person or family refused to heed the emperor's, emperor's decree, you can be sure that the penalty is going to be harsh indeed. The Romans were not known for showing mercy. Unfortunately, Caesar's decree meant that many people were forced to travel away from where they were living to their hometowns because that is where their names are going to be listed on the official register in the books. It didn't matter whether you were rich, whether you were poor, every person was required to make this journey in order to give an account for themselves to the Roman government. And so Luke tells us that everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. I want to point out something to you that I think is important for us to understand. This is what we read in 1 Samuel 17. Now David was the son of an Ephratite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Prophet Isaiah tells us, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, 
From his roots a branch will, will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This is what we read from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. And finally, this is from the prophet Micah. Many of you are familiar with this one. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. The reason I wanted to read from these prophets is because they're all pointing to the same thing. Hundreds of years before the events found here in Luke's gospel, hundreds of years before the birth of Caesar Augustus, God was telling us about the details of the Savior's birth. Did Joseph and Mary have any reason at all whatsoever to leave what they were doing, to drop what they were doing, and to make their way to the city of David, Bethlehem? Of course not. In fact, they probably didn't want to do that at all. In fact, Mary was very, very pregnant. The journey would be very difficult. But because of the decree of Caesar Augustus, who was acting out of his own greed, out of his own power, Joseph and Mary would be in the exact place that God wanted them to be. And it was because of Caesar's decree that the Christ child would be born in the very place that God had decreed hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So the question we need to ask ourselves, and the one that is just as relevant today as it was in the time of Jesus' birth, is who is really in charge here? Was Caesar actually the one calling the shots? Was he really the most powerful being that the world has known? You see, without even knowing it, Caesar himself was an instrument of God. Much like King Nebuchadnezzar was during the, the days of Jewish captivity, he was being used as an instrument to do God's will. God uses even unbelievers to bring about his divine purposes. Did you know that? Sometimes we forget. And what that should tell us is that our time is no different. There is never a time that God is not in control, no matter who's sitting in the White House, what is going on in the world, what other uh, thing might be happening in your life. God is always, always, always in control. There's never a time when God says, I wasn't aware of that. What am I going to do now? That doesn't happen. From an earthly perspective, all those subject to making this journey to their hometowns in order to be taxed was simply just another jab at the people who were ruled by a foreign nation. Just a reminder that they're conquered. They could see no good in it. In fact, this was bad. But what Caesar meant for a means of keeping people in suppression, keeping them in line, God was using for the glory of his kingdom. And I wonder what it would do for our own mental states if we were willing to try to view the things going on in our world from a more heavenly perspective. Can we do that? How is God going to use the pandemic for his glory? Have you ever thought about that? How is God going to use the uh, new leadership in our political offices for his glory? God can do that. Despite what some people might think, it doesn't matter which party you happen to be affiliated with, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you were for Trump, you're against Trump, you're for Obama uh, or for Biden. God isn't surprised about our leaders. God knows. How is God going to use the difficult circumstances in your life to bring about his glory? Do we think that way? Can we live like that? Can we live with the hope that God is working even if we don't quite understand it and, and don't really know what's happening? Can we live with a trust like that? We might not get the answers to these types of questions right away, but we can be certain that in every circumstance, God is there. Every circumstance falls under the leadership of God. And perhaps that is why Luke begins the account of Jesus' birth in this way. In the midst of a world that is ruled by political and social forces that keep people in subjugation, keep them pressed down, God sent forth his only begotten son. It's a reminder that the world that Christ was born into is our world, isn't it? A world that is upside down and backward. 
That is the world that Jesus came to save. In the providence of God, all things work toward his purpose. The Savior was born in a manner that the world did not expect. We already mentioned the prophecies concerning the birthplace of of Jesus. Here Luke tells us, Joseph went there to Bethlehem to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Let's stop there for a second. We hear those words that are so familiar to us, but actually, you know, when we hear them, they just sort of fall right away. But listen to the underlying conflict in what Luke says here. Joseph went to Bethlehem with his fiancée who was pregnant. In that ancient culture, that would have been a no-no. Still is today, in fact. But in that ancient culture, that would have been a scandal. The world would not understand the situation. In fact, Joseph, him, Joseph himself had to be informed by the angel because he assumed the worst. He didn't know what was going on either. But now these two people, bound together in love and now bound together by the holy calling of God, are going to the very place where the Savior is to be born according to Scripture. Let me ask you something. Is this the way that you, have, you would have come up with to bring the Savior of humanity into the world? I would have probably designated a very wealthy and powerful woman, maybe a queen, and I would have had the Savior born in a, you know, a beautiful marble palace surrounded by the finest things in life in complete comfort. That's the way a Savior should be born, right? But God chose a young, unknown woman engaged to a carpenter to be born in an insignificant peasant village. That's what Bethlehem was. It's a peasant village. God's ways are not our ways. When we stop to think about the situation, how much more can you and I relate to a Savior who was born really in much the same way we were? I don't know about you, but I wasn't born into opulent wealth. Sorry, honey. I wasn't born surrounded by the finest things to important people. My parents weren't important, wealthy people. In the scheme of the world, my parents were nobody. Your parents were probably nobody too. And I think what that tells us is that our lives are very similar to each other's. We all share common values. You know, I wasn't born in a barn, although my mom often asked me if I was. She probably, and I said, well, you should know, you were there. (laughs) The Savior that God sent to save us is a Savior who can relate to us, to our own lives. Our lives are messy complicated, aren't they? Our lives are often filled with things that seem scandalous to other people, and sometimes those situations are because we made some pretty bad choices somewhere along the lines, and now we have to deal with them. But the story of Jesus' birth, as told by Luke, is a story that reminds us that life isn't perfect. In fact, this was not the ideal situation for Mary to finally go into labor. Luke tells us, while they were there, the time came for the the baby to be born. Of course it did. Why wouldn't it? What else could go wrong, right? Miles and miles away from home, nothing with them but probably a small knapsack and a donkey. Mary goes into labor. How terrified Joseph must have been. What am I going to do for her? How am I going to fix this situation? How scared Mary must have been. I got nowhere to go here. Am I going to give birth along the side of a road? What mother would want to do that? And on top of that, Luke was on to say, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. We could laugh right now when we hear those words, couldn't we? On top of everything else, there was no room for them to have a suitable place to deliver a baby. Where were they going to go? What were they going to do? The solution, give birth in a barn and lay the baby in an animal feeding trough. That's what they did. This is the way that God's Son is introduced to the world. God's ways are not our ways. But again, you and I can probably relate with a story like that, can't we? We, have, uh, we all have those situations where, we, where things go from bad to worse to even worse still. But we do what we can with what we have. And in this situation, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, was born in the lowest places 
surrounded by common everyday things. We can relate with a savior like that. Someone who is like us, but also unlike us. And that he's different because he is without sin. Why was there no room for the couple? Well, the answer is because of Caesar's decree. If there was some sort of a a small inn that happened to be in Bethlehem, no doubt it was booked up for the night. So God's son, the great shepherd of the sheep, was born in the company of farm animals. Is that what the world expected? No. In fact, when the wise men from the east, according to Matthew, came looking for the king of the Jews, where did they go? The first place that you would expect to find a king, right? They go to the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, and they go to the palace because that is where a king should be. The king wasn't there. That's what the world might expect. But once again, God's ways are not our ways. In Luke's gospel especially, the good news is directed towards those who are humble and weak and poor and powerless and bound and oppressed. And the manner in which Jesus came into the world reflects the purpose for which he came. The Savior was born in a manner that the world did not expect, wouldn't be looking for. And yet the significance of this birth was so profound and so world-altering that the vast expanse of the universe was directed towards this little town, this little no-name town of Bethlehem. You would think that the whole world needed to hear about this, right? Everybody needs to hear this great news. But no, that's not what happened. In keeping with the message of the good news for the marginalized of the world, Luke tells us something that almost seems absurd, really. At this moment, we might be expected to be transported into the city of Jerusalem and enter the the center of Jewish life where uh, packed streets are there, ready and waiting to hear about this wonderful news. But that's not what happens. Instead, Luke tells us, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Shepherds? Shepherds? Really? Nobodies. Towards the bottom end of the social scale. Shepherds. Instead of bringing us to a packed city with people ready and waiting to to hear this news, this good news, Luke brings us to an essentially silent and empty countryside where there are just a few shepherds out there keeping watch over their sleeping sheep. Let's say it one more time. God's ways are not our ways. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of joy that will be for all the people. Gabriel's work was not yet done. One more task left, and he appears to these shepherds and announces to them the greatest news that the world has ever known and will ever know. And this news is not only for a select few, rather this news is for all the people, everyone. And what is this glorious news? He says, today in the town of David, a Savior is born to you, Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Interesting. The good news that a Savior has been born is first meant to be received and that it is meant to be shared. The greatest news in the history of the world was revealed to only a few, a very select few. And we might ask why? Why did God choose shepherds to be the first recipients of the birth of the Savior? Well, we already mentioned that the gospel is specifically designated to those who are marginalized and powerless in society, and shepherds certainly fit that that particular designation. Could be that just as King David was a shepherd, also living in Bethlehem, that it was appropriate for shepherds to hear about the good news of a true shepherd. But maybe it's a reminder that the good news of the gospel always starts in the quiet of our own hearts before it spreads to other people, in the darkness of our own hearts. In this instance, the angel points to the sign of a baby being wrapped in swaddling cloths and placed in a manger. And really, if we carry that all the way through in Luke's gospel, You can see in this birth narrative a little bit of a picture of the death of Jesus where he's wrapped, his body is wrapped and he's placed in a tomb. Somebody else is doing this to him. 
We kind of have an image of that here in the birth of Jesus. This is an invitation, really, for the shepherds to go and see for themselves. Go check this out. By the way, that's really all sharing the gospel is. It's an invitation to go check this out. Go see if it's really true. It's declaring the good news and inviting other people to, to do the same. Go, go see if my words are true. See if Jesus really is who he says he is and that he can do what he promises to do for you. How would the news of a, that a Savior has been born spread to the rest of the world when it started with just these insignificant shepherds? And the answer is that the shepherds needed to do the same thing that Gabriel did to them. They need to share the good news and invite people to go check it out for themselves. How do people today hear about the good news of a Savior? The angels appear to them. I suppose it could happen. But the answer is that you and I need to tell other people about him. We need to talk about the Savior. This is news that's not meant to be kept to ourselves. It's good news for all the people. It's a message for all people because all people are just like us. We were in need of a Savior because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And after delivering the message to the shepherds, Luke tells us that suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. It's interesting that in the context of the decree of Caesar Augustus, the supposed godlike figure who was famous for initiating the Pax Romana, the true son of God was born bringing the kind of peace that affected not just the known Roman world, but the whole world, the whole earth. In response to such glorious news, a choir of angels comes down from their heavenly chambers and declares God's glory and God's mercy. Where do angels dwell? They dwell in the presence of God, wherever heaven happens to be in the vast expanse of the universe. But in that vast expanse that includes all of our planets, all the stars, all of the galaxies that are measured in light years, the ones that God can measure with the span of his hand, the angels came to a countryside outside of Bethlehem to tell the world that God's son had been born today. That's the good news. And the angel provides for us the proper response to that good news. Praise. Gloria in excelsis Deo is the Latin phrase. The glory of God in the highest heaven was revealed in the feeding trough and surrounded by common farm animals because there was no room for him in the inn. One more time. God's ways are not our ways. The God who measures the heavens with his hand took on human flesh and dwelt among us to give us his peace. And the peace he brings is ours when we embrace that good news for ourselves. You see, the reality is good news is not good news if it has no effect on how we live or any hope for our future. You see, news is just an arbitrary word meaning something that has happened. Something that has happened in history. It's just the facts. News happens all the time, both exciting news as well as troubling news. But God has given us good news. And the question we are called to answer each and every year as we celebrate Christmas is, is that good news to you? Have you embraced that wonderful gift for yourself that today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you and to me? He is Christ. He is the Lord. As Gabriel tells Joseph, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's God's good news. That's the message of Christmas. And for all those who are willing to recognize their hopelessness, to recognize their helplessness, the news of a Savior is good news indeed. Is that good news to you? Gloria in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest heavens. May the shepherds be our guide as we join with them in saying, let us go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has come to pass. May each of us seek the Christ child in our hearts once again and on bended knee worship Christ, the newborn king. Let's pray together. 
Our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you once again for the gift of a Savior. As we mentioned throughout this message, your ways are not our ways. Your Savior was born in a way that we did not expect, that we would never think of. But in every way, it's reflective of who we are and who, who he came to save. That he became like us in every way except for sin. He met us in our lowly states, and when we receive him, he raises us to be children of God, heirs of eternal life. And what a precious gift. And for all those who may be reluctant in receiving that gift, we pray that their hearts would be open this time, this year, that your spirit would be working even now. Open their hearts, help them to receive the truth of the Savior, and praise you for who you are and who you've made us to be. We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. I invite you to stand once again as we sing one more of our Christmas, uh, Christmas favorites, hymn number 188, Angels We Have Heard on High. You probably couldn't see that, but my granddaughter was trying to get me to wrap things up. <laughs> Let's close our time with prayer. Thank you, God, for the wonderful gift of a Savior. Help us reflect the image of our Lord Jesus Christ to every person we meet, to every person we say Merry Christmas to. Let the world see the grace that we have been given. And now may God who sent his angels to proclaim the glad news of the Savior's birth fill you with joy and make you heralds of the gospel. Go forth in Christmas peace for Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs>